There we go. Recording in progress. All right. Well, we want to thank everyone for joining us this evening, or if you're watching this later, thank you for joining us this morning, afternoon, evening, whatever it is for you. Um, this is our Signs and Seasons First Fruits broadcast for ER for the year 5783, 2023, I think is where we are at right now. <laughs> <laughs> the last couple of months, uh-oh, what did I do? Last couple of months have been a little wonky, so I'm losing track of days yes. and, weeks and months, apparently. So welcome, everyone, for being with us tonight. I want to thank you for joining us. We are looking forward to the uh, shared revelation that the Lord has given us uh, for this month. And the Issachar tribe is front and center this month, and we are so excited to hear what the Lord has to say about times and seasons and where we are right now as the Ecclesia and as a nation and as just as people throughout the world. Your hosts this evening, as usual, are uh, Deborah Taylor, Laura Judah, and myself, Rachel Wilkins. So I'm going to hand this off real quickly to Deb for our opening prayer and our shofar blast. And then we're going to just dive right in. Deb. Okay, Lord, we just thank you for everything you're revealing. It's so exciting what's going on in this time and season. And um, as we get deeper into it, Lord, um, we just praise you for your revelation. And as we dive into tonight, we'll see how your revelation is revealing secret things, how it's revealing so many things about your plans and, um, and the season for which they're going to happen. So we thank you for that. And I'm going to blow this so far, and I hope you all can hear it. I still have not consulted with Johnny Inlow on it. <laughs> Nada, it was such a good blast. <laughs> this one's not so good because I'm down here. Did you hear that one? I heard a squeak. It was squeaky because I was leaning over the one i was doing standing up was great yeah we got to figure out why that doesn't work other people blow the shofar and we can hear it so i just don't like yeah. it's completely not there anyway wow. we Take know it it's there and we know that god hears it and it has cleared our atmosphere and yes. we praise god for that amen Everything in heaven and earth and uh, over and uh, under the earth for that. Amen. Yes. Amen. All right, Miss Laura, you're up. Okay. So um, I am going to set the stage as I usually do, <laughs> just kind of uh, reiterating where we've come from and where we're going. Um, Last time we met, which literally feels like it was yesterday, was uh, for Passover, right? <laughs> In the middle of the month, so it's only been two weeks. Um, but wow, what an exciting Passover this has been. And I really wasn't ready to move to a new month yet. I still felt like there was so much rich richness in the month of Nisan. And so I'm kind of lingering still in that place personally. Um, but this month is a connector month between Nisan and Savan when we will um, celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. And the fact that it's a connector month has you know, several different ways that we can look at that. Um, I've been really focused on counting the Omer. That's a tradition that the Hebrew people had as they counted the 50 days between uh, Passover and Pentecost in anticipation of what they were going to experience uh, when they got to, to the Mount, Mount Sinai. And God had really amazing things in store for them. They really had no clue what was going on. But God had instituted this time to build their faith and to help them transition from a life of slavery into a life of being blessed in the promised land. Or, or no, I sh that's not right. 
not in the promised land. They were going to Mount Sinai and to be blessed when they heard what the Lord wanted to speak to them there, because it's quite amazing. And I'm not going to get ahead of ourselves and talk about that now, but um, I think that it's really important that we focus on this, this aspect of being in a connector month and counting the Omer, building our expectancy. And, um, you know, they did a lot of complaining as they were going through the wilderness. They came out of, out of uh, Egypt as slaves. They had gold and silver with them. They had taken the plunder. They got through the sea, which was absolutely an incredible miracle. And then they got to the other side and within three days they were complaining and whining. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And, um, you know, we all know that story pretty well. So mm -hmm. I don't want to belabor that point, but I want to bring it home in, in our own lives. Um, I personally feel like what we're going through this year um, is, is something completely new. We've talked for many, many years about how the Lord is bringing us through this transition time into a kingdom era. And this year, I think we can all see that the Lord is, again, causing the, the kingdom era to come into a manifestation. And we've been changing. The Lord has been changing us. He's been uh, working on the rough edges. He's been pulling things out of us. He's been pouring new stuff into us. And he's calling us to new levels in him so that we can partner with him in the harvest that he is is beginning to bring forth it's happening now we're not waiting for it it's actually happening and so in this year when things are happening in ways that we've never seen happen before we clearly know that we are in this huge spiritual battle between good and evil we see that God is moving in unprecedented ways that he's releasing his spirit and that he is bringing forth revival um, you know, I hope every one of you that's listening has testimonies of your own that you can say you've seen God do stuff that you've been praying for for years. Maybe they're still, you know, not the big thing that you've been praying for, but I've seen some pretty big things already. And I'm very, very excited about that. And every time you see a miracle fulfilled or a, a prayer that you've been lingering and, and contending for for a long time, you know, your faith should just be rising and rising and rising and giving you that strength to believe for every other thing that you've been praying for and that God's promised you. So when we think about building expectation, that's what I'm thinking of is like, you know, get out your journals and Go back and rehearse the promises of God and think about the things that he said about you and your family and even bigger things that he said uh, that you would do, um, you know, maybe in your city, in your state, in the nations, who knows, like we've all got some promises that maybe we were even afraid to believe because they just seem so big and off the charts, but God has not forgotten any of those. And if he said it, he's going to do it. So uh, when we think about what the Hebrews were doing with all that complaining, when we start to step closer to our miracle, uh, you would think logically that we would be all happy and excited and willing to flow with the Lord in a much better way. But often the change itself, like the, they, when, when they were in the desert for all those years and they were living off manna, that when the day came that they crossed into the promised land, they had to switch from just going outside their tent and scooping up manna, which was very simple, to planting crops and harvesting crops 
which required a whole different skill set. You know, they had to change everything in their lives to to become those harvesters now. And yes, it would be great that they got to eat like a rich, huge diet change. And they had these enormous uh, grapes and everything was so abundant, but they had to work for it in a way that they hadn't before. So, um, you know, I found myself doing a little bit of complaining here lately about some things that the Lord's been having me do. And all of a sudden I realized, oh my goodness, what am I doing? Like, I shouldn't be complaining about those things because they're a sign that what the Lord promised is actually on its way. The abundance of the new season is coming. And yes. so, you know, zip your mm -hmm. lip and just move on. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my encouragement today is to um, to everybody to just re-examine, you know, what is it that the Lord's having you do that may seem like a disconnect at the moment, but it's really connected to you reaping those promises that you've been waiting for for a long time. So good. It's really good. Um, so so um, using the discipline of counting the omer, you know, you can look at that like when you used to make those little paper chains and do a countdown to Christmas or whatever, you know, that's what counting the omer is all about. And it actually was an instruction given by God. You know, he told them count off seven weeks. And that's why even the Feast of Pentecost is caused, called the Feast of Weeks because there was a, a clear thing that the Lord had in his mind for his people to be counting and anticipating and getting excited about what he wanted to do. And what a disappointment to his heart when he had to send that first group back into the wilderness after that time frame that, you know, that they were, well, I'm kind of mixing up stories here, but they got to the seven weeks where they went to Mount Sinai, but then for them to carry on and actually get to the promised land was several more months. But then he had to send them back because they hadn't developed the faith to go in. And we don't want to be those people. We want to be full of faith. We want to be seeing every little thing that God's doing and praising him for it. Mm -hmm. And um, seeking the promises in the word, you know, go back and read the word that substantiate the promises that he's talked about. And I think you'll see in most cases that um, the word takes on like a new life because the Holy Spirit is illuminating things in a new way, in a, in a much richer way, a much fuller way. And something that you might have only understood partially in this season, you're going to understand it in, in a richer, more full way. So that's pretty exciting as well. Um, anybody want to add anything to that? Yeah, I just, what the thing you said there at the end, I think is so, we want to not let that slip by that we, which is why we do these calls year after year, month after month, because we've been doing them for about three or four years now. And we've talked several times and amongst ourselves and felt that every time we do another Nissan call or another ER call or another whatever the month is, we are picking up and gleaning deeper revelation than we had the year before. And there's things that we didn't catch. And that's why God's cycles are so important. That's why he cycles us back through you know, yes. um, different, you know, seasons change and, um, you know, even within like in nature within a year, there are four seasons and it's the same four seasons every year. It's not four seasons this year and a whole different four seasons next year and a whole different four. It's summer, winter, spring, and fall. And each one has its own, uh, nuances, its own blessings, its own challenges. And so there's a, there's something to the cycle the cycles that the Lord has us in so that we circle back and we don't, we, we remember where we came from. We see the altars that were built when they built, when, when they were building altars in the wilderness, when something happened, they would, Moses would build an altar or Jacob or whoever. 
um, throughout the Old Testament, we see them building altars uh, where things that were important happened so that this serves as a remembrance. So when we pass by here again, or our children, or our grandchildren pass by, they're going to remember what God did here. And so we circle back by those. And at the same time, it's kind of like we're going, we're ascending at the same time. It's not like we're going around in circles, which is a pointless journey. <laughs> Circling back by as we are ascending. And, you know, it's more like, to me, it's more like a spiral. Yes. We're still seeing these things, but at the same time, we're getting closer to his heart and we get new revelation. We get new insight every time. Amen. Amen. That's so good. I also, I, when you, I was thinking about when, well, it was, I was reading back through the whole Passover story this year. And, um, what, one thing I picked up on just because of raising my daughter that when, um, well, I've raised three kids, but specifically this daughter I've learned more from, um, than I did the other two, but when the, they complain, but God didn't do any, he didn't say, oh, you're not getting any water because you complained. He gave them what they complained about. You know, we're thirsty. We need water. And they're like, well, you should have left us in Israel. To, no, in Egypt. So we could die there. At least we had water <laughs> and that kind of thing. And he, what did he do? He, gave, he told Moses how to heal the water and the same through, like if you just read through the miracles, they cried that they didn't have meat. So we gave them meat. He didn't punish them for their whining, so to speak. And I'm wondering, you know, because we all, that's how we perceive them as whiners. <laughs> well, whining teenagers. <laughs> Brett and yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Like, but, you know, you, I wonder if we don't have the, the right paradigm for them. Mm -hmm. Um. I mean, to imagine what they went through and why would they, you know, they were not uncomfortable in Egypt. God had to reveal to them that they were even slaves. They didn't even understand that they were slaves. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's similar to, to today Yeah. Uh, and what we're going through, you know, and then are we going to, when things change and the Lord does his thing. I hope that we're not going to be going, you should have left us the way we were. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord, no. Well, I don't think that that's, um, you know, I think that we possibly have been doing that, mm. you know, because the whole idea is that they were slaves in Egypt. They had, you know, certain provisions given to them. I don't know what that was. Um, you know, they talk about that they had good food and everything, but they didn't realize that they were slaves. Well, that mm -hmm. is exactly parallel to what we've been going through. Right. You know, I mean, up until a few years ago, uh, who, at least in America, whoever went to the grocery store and didn't get what you wanted, you know, right. I mean, we, we had the things that we need, but we had learned how to get those things on our own. We didn't have to trust God. And so, you know, I've thought so many times about my own self, like, I don't want to be that whiner, but I know that's what I'm, what I'm acting like right now, because mm -hmm. it's hard to trust God when you've lived in that place of, of slavery, you know, yeah. but God is so abundant and he wanted to show them that he was very capable of mm -hmm. giving them provision. And, um, you know, after they left Mount Sinai and he made a covenant with them, then he did start to get angry because right. he was like, come on, guys, you know, yeah. I'm demonstrating my provision to you. And so, you know, for many of us, we may just be starting to go through that kind of a process, but um, others of us are on the coming out on the other side of Sinai. and. Mm -hmm we've learned how to trust God in ways that we didn't know before. I'm not mm -hmm. saying we know completely, but we've gotten better at it, yeah. <laughs> at least in certain realms, you know? And um, that's why I was saying at the beginning about building your faith, because when you do start seeing God answer the big prayers, then it's like, 
oh my gosh, I haven't just been praying all this stuff in vain. You know, God really is that kind of a, a gracious father to us. Amen. So let's not be whiners. The whining. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I, I'm going to just quickly move on then and, and kind of piggyback on what you were talking about, Rachel, of the, the whole reason why we do the, these broadcasts and why we enjoy talking about it is because of an Issachar anointing. And we are now in the month of Issachar. And Issachar was the one who um, knew the times and the seasons, and they knew what Israel should do. That's what the Bible says about their tribe. Mm -hmm. And so we've, we've set ourselves to be people that are pursuing that prophetic anointing from mm -hmm. God so that we would be understanding of the times that we're living in. We would be taking note of everything going on around us. We would be connecting the dots from what God's word says to what we're actually living and seeing what did God say about this time long before it ever came. Yes. And mm -hmm. now that we see that it's happening, just like Daniel did, when our, our um, Jeremiah did, when he saw that what Daniel had seen was coming to pass. Mm -hmm. Do I have that right? Yeah, Jeremiah came after Daniel. <laughs> and so, or no, I don't know. Anyway, you get the point. We want to see, even though God's word isn't explicit like it was back then, it's there for us to see because he did write about an end time generation and he wrote about a kingdom generation. And we have to be wise enough to know that that's us. You know, that is our generation. We are in this place now and we should be going through the word with great anticipation and expectation of what did the Lord say about it and realizing that much of what he said was really, really good. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's tough times, but what the Lord says about us is really good promises. And so again, another reason to have, to keep increasing your expectation that we are stepping into good things. And the mm -hmm. Lord is with us. And oh, good. when we when we embrace that Issachar anointing, uh, there's so many ways that that manifests. And each one of us, you know, we all looked at um, at this month, and we latched on to the phrase in in Chuck's book that says, you know, that God is revealing the mysteries of His kingdom. And we all got excited about that. And each one of us was like, oh, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about that. <laughs> so we each have a piece of the puzzle that we want to bring forth tonight because um, that's true. That's what the Lord is doing. The, um, so I'm going to turn it over to Rachel right now to talk about um, how she was seeing what God was saying about mysteries and mm -hmm. secrets. So the things that kind of just jumped out for me uh, this week as I was kind of studying into this Exodus 15, 16 and 17 are where God is revealing as they're in this journey, God is revealing himself in different capacities or different parts of who he is to Israel. And in 15, we see him reveal himself as Jehovah Rapha. In 16, we see him re reveal himself as Jehovah Jireh. And in chapter 17 is the one that kind of just took my focus. And this is where um, the first half of the chapter is where they came to uh, a place called Rephidim. And it's where there was uh, there were no there was no water. They were quarreling. They were screaming at Moses, give us water, give us water. And um, the Lord, they grumbled and complained again. And. And God told him, hit the rock. He was. He goes to the Lord, what am I supposed to do with these people? <laughs> what, what, what am I supposed to do with them? And the Lord said, and he said, pass, though he said, pass on before them 
taking with you the elders, some of the elders of Israel, and taking your hand, your staff, with which you struck the Nile and go before. So long story short, he told him to strike the rock, and he did, and water came out. And Moses called the name of that place the Massah and Meribah, which mean um, testing and quarreling. This is the place of testing and quarreling. Now, Rephidim, I want to kind of focus on the second half of the chapter because Rephidim, the meaning of that word actually means rests or stays, resting places. So this was a resting place that God brought them to. Called The place was called Rephidim, which meant a resting place. And But the enemy came, sneaks in. He doesn't like us to have that place of rest. He doesn't like us to have that place of shalom and peace. So he stirs up stuff, quarreling, complaining, so that it becomes not only a place of complaining, but we see in the second half of the chapter, while they were there, is when the Amalekites, Amalekites came in and to try to fight them and to war again became now a battlefield. This place of rest is now a battlefield. And so Moses goes up to the top of the mountain and or the top of the hill with his staff in his hand and he raises his hand as long as the hand, his hand is up, they were winning. Israel was winning. But as, if he got tired and lowered him, then Amalek would win, would start to win. So here come Aaron and her. They brought him a little a rock, they like a bench, a seat, a stool, some kind of rock to sit on. And then they hold his hands up for the entire day. These two men stood there and held up his hands. And so the victory was theirs. So what I saw in that is that Moses was assuming a position of praise. And one of the Hebrew words for praise is yada, which means to lift up your hands, hands extended to the Lord. And this position is one of thanksgiving. It's one of a cry for help. It's like a child reaching up, daddy, help me, pick me up. And it's of surrender. It's the international sign for surrender. When you know law enforcement comes in, what do you do? Lift your hands up, you know. And this is the position that that Moses was in. That yada, hands lifted, uh, that brought the victory. And I want us to kind of just settle on that for a second. That in in that position of praise, even though he didn't have it in himself to keep it that long. They held his hands up. And as long as that position of praise was held, the victory was theirs. God brought the victory. So, um, hold on, I'll check my notes here. There's a couple of things I want to make sure we don't skip over here. Um, so when this was over, when the sun went down, the Lord said to Moses, write this in a memorial, as a memorial in a book, and recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar, and he called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. He built an altar. The Lord is my banner. That's that victory again. So that's where that Jehovah Nisi comes from, is that's what Moses named that altar of that place. The Lord is our banner. The Lord is my banner. And um The hand, the Lord is my banner, saying, a hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So now it's no longer their battle. He's saying, if Amalek comes against us anymore, they're, they're coming against him. The Lord will have war with Amalek. Their, their, their war is not with Israel anymore. It's with him. It's with Jehovah Nisi. And so I think for, for me, and for us, one of the things that we want us to catch on to this month is in a place that the enemy will try to steal your joy. He will try to steal your peace. He will try to steal your rest. And that is exactly where God wants you to be. He wants us to be in a place of rest. We war and battle in the heavenlies from a position of rest. We have to because we have to rest in him. If we're, if we're going about on our own, uh, with our own wits and our own strength and our own ideas and our own whatever, we're going to fail. We're going to get slapped around. But if we, as we rest in him and the battle and we realize that the battle is the Lord's and allow him to fight and to take the position of praise and of worship, 
that victory is sure. Our victory is sure in him. And so as he, the, during this month of Is of, with Issachar being the, the focus, God reveals his secrets to his people. He, in, in the Old Testament, Issachar was the tribe that the Lord was really putting that grace on to receive. That was, that was their mission. That was their assignment to know the times and seasons. In Matthew 13, Jesus looks at his disciples and he said, it is granted to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. So all 12 disciples and by extension, all of us. Now he's expanded it out saying, I'm giving you. He didn't say whichever one of you is from the tribe of Issachar, that's the one I'm giving you. No, he said, I'm giving all of you the, the, to understand the mystery, to know the mysteries of his kingdom. So we have that capacity. We have that grace on us if we will tap into it to understand. And Amen. he gives wisdom and understanding. Uh, let's see. There was a verse. I'm going to check on that. Um, in Daniel 2, 21 and 22, talks about the Lord revealing deep and secret things. And then in Matthew, we talk about Matthew 13, James 1. We have to ask for wisdom. He said, if any of you lacks wisdom, come and ask and I'll give it. I'll give you. All we have to do is ask. And so how the other thing I wanted oh, before that. Okay, so before I get off of that, valleys. Okay, so when they came into the valley of Rephidim, um, this is where the Amalekites came. The Amalekites were descendants of Esau. I know I'm backing up just a little bit. They were descendants of Esau who sold his birthright. He was who by birth had the he was the oldest, but he sold it to Jacob. And Amalek actually means dweller in a valley. So valleys are low places. Okay, there's the low places. And valleys are places of rest and respite, but we're not called to dwell in the valley. We're called to the valley. He brings us to valleys, to those quiet places of rest and respite. Then, you, then what does he do? How many times in the scripture do we, especially in the Old Testament and the Psalms, do we see God saying, come up here? Ascend to the mountain of the Lord. Come up here with me at Mount Sinai. All that he called the entire nation up Sinai to, to meet with him. They didn't do it because they were scared. But he was calling. He's been constantly calling us up. Come up here. Come up here. Come up higher. So he's called us to dwell in the higher places. And we're seated in heavenly places with him. Now, not we will be, but we are now seated in heavenly places with him. So he's constantly calling us up. And I just want us to kind of keep that in mind. So when you're going through one of these valley times, it's not for you to build a house down there. <laughs> we don't want to be having the whole, the whole friends in a low place this thing. Okay. So <laughs> we're, we got friends in higher places, our, our, our calling and our, 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 um, our dwelling, our place of existence, our home, I guess is higher places seated in heavenly places with him and as we seated there we see more we if you're sitting you know when when jesus was tempted by satan and satan took him to this high mountain from which he could see the entire all the kingdoms of the world it's a high place you have to go up high to see all that you can't see all that from down the valley or halfway up the mountain you're only going to have a limited view so to get a full view we have to be up on that top those higher places. And so when we're up there, we see more clearly the bigger picture. And instead of just the one little thing that's right in front of us, you know, the little trees or flowers in the valley, we see all of it, you know. And I think that's important that we grab onto that. That's the whole, to me, that's kind of the whole crux of knowing times and seasons is spending time in those places, those higher places with him so that our eyes can see a, a bigger picture of what he's doing and not, you know, just our own little thing. And there was one other thing, Daniel, when they, I know John in revelation, when they were called up to Sinai, what scared them was the thunder and the lightning and the, the noise. It looks, it looked like a big storm. Well, revelation, I want to say chapter four ish. John is taken 
before the throne in the throne room and it was thunder and lightning and voices it wasn't this peaceful little shh, you know we have to be quiet in the presence of god because it's so yes it's a holy place but his throne room is loud his throne room is thunder lightning and voices and loud it says loud voices even. loud voices but that and that is exactly what they were seeing on the mountain when God was calling them up, he was literally manifesting his throne room on that mountain, yes. the thunder and the lightning and the, all these loudness. And that's what scared them because it was new to them. They didn't understand it. And people are afraid of what they don't understand. <laughs> you know. And so may we not fall into that trap of being afraid of what we don't understand that we've never seen before. But as we, as God reveals and exposes himself and reveals himself to his people in greater ways that we have never even thought possible or had any idea it was like that because it's different or or outside of our paradigm or some weird thing we've never seen before. Let us not reject that, but we run to that and embrace it and embrace all of who he is. It might be a little uncomfortable at first, but hallelujah, I want to stay there anyway because it's going to be glorious, glorious, glorious. Amen. Amen. That's what I got. Good stuff. Yeah, and um, that point that you made there about not staying focused on our own little world, that is such a huge point because, you know, the enemy is going to do everything he can to keep you focused inwardly. Me, my, and all the stuff that's happening in my life um, mm -hmm. is so distracting and so difficult sometimes that you can't see you know, how God might be calling you to work in a bigger realm. And so it prevents you from entering into the fullness of your calling. And uh, we lose sight of all that. And everything is just, you know, the, the, the bigger things that the Lord has for you then are all just put on hold. And if you don't break out of that, if you don't become intentional about breaking out of that, you might miss it all together, mm -hmm. you know? And mm -hmm. I mean, even the thought of like the end times, like how many people, I'll just throw this challenge out there, <laughs> you know, how many people have really spent a lot of time praying, talking to God, reading the word and trying to understand what does the end times really look like and what's going to happen when Jesus returns? Mm -hmm. You know, do you have that worked out in your own thinking? Do you have a vision? Has the Lord given you um, a plan and a strategy for how you're, you're going to be instrumental in bringing it about and in helping others bring it about? Because that's what we're called to do. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not supposed to just sit here and go, oh, well, God will work that out. And, you know, I'm just going to cross over the line when my day comes. No, we're supposed to be engaged as his bride uh -huh. with him running uh -huh. on the hills, you know? Right. So talk about expectation. I just, I remember the first time that the Lord challenged me and to really like get serious about this and ask me questions and read my word with the intention of understanding Jesus is really coming and it's not that far off. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, and to kind of dovetail on that just a little bit, this is where we have to be. I really think we need to ask Holy Spirit to open up our heart and our eyes to understand this and how we individually have fallen into this trap because our culture is so self driven. And this is why, to a large degree, our country has gotten into the position and the state that it's in because of a, as long as it doesn't affect me personally, I'm not going to worry about it. Yeah. And it, or until it affects my pocketbook, I'm not going to worry about it. That's why so few people vote. That's why so few people pay attention to who is in office, number one, and number two, what they're doing yep. until there's a, an ordinance or a law passed that affects them personally. You know, I'm not going to go vote in a school board election because I don't have kids and it doesn't affect me. Yes, it does. 
Oh, I don't have kids, but what is going on in our schools affects everybody because these are they, they are training and raising up and educating the next generation of leaders. And if we turn a blind eye and only pay attention when it affects us personally, we are digging our own grave. And we've done it in the in our country. We've done it in the church. And as long as you know, for so long. You know, one of the things that this that these movies that have come out lately have brought to the forefront is that the church for a long time didn't know how and still doesn't to a large degree how to handle sexual sin, addictions, divorce, domestic violence, the horrible things that go on behind closed doors, not just in the world, but in the church and in leadership. The church doesn't know still how to handle to a large degree, doesn't know how to handle that, what to do with it. Yeah. So we either brush it under the rug or we look away, pretend we didn't see that, or we celebrate it and put sin on a pedestal, you know? Um, so we have, until it affects us personally, I'm not going to worry about that. So long story short, I guess is that we have to, we need to come to a place of repentance on this and ask him individually, Lord, where have I closed a blind eye? Where have I? not paid attention and that's that's what we how we got to this whole jesus is coming back on a rescue mission lie yeah you know is because well we'll just kind of keep doing our thing and he'll get here when he gets here and until then i'm just going to keep trucking away and doing my thing and he'll come get me sooner or later Mm -mm. yeah that's not that's not occupy until i come that's not what that looks like right Okay, so are we ready to move to the next one? Take your opportunity while you can. I know. Let me get it in there. Well, I wanted to, um, I was going to go over, I'm going to go over slightly covenant promises, but I think we already touched on them all a couple times. But um, that we're in covenant with the Lord. And just like the Israelites were in covenant with the Lord, we, he made us promises. He's our healer. He's our provider. And, and Rachel just did this great story. He is our victory. And so um, the Israelites were in that covenant with him too. They just didn't quite believe it. And I think we're in the same place, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, you know, it's really tough to, to rely on him to be our healer and our provider. And, our, and, and he has the victory to sit down and let him fight the battle but this doesn't go against what Rachel was saying about being you don't close you don't turn a blind eye to the battle either it's just the battle is the Lord's he will we engage in the way he tells us to engage and usually you know it can be by prayer by by taking public office by voting by speaking the word out of speaking out and um so many of us don't give our own opinion, but I'm not here to touch on that. Um, that we we went over that already. I just wanted to say that the Lord is our victory and he will fight for us. Um, and it's also written in, so this month is, I just want to talk about, I'm just amazed every month that I'm studying these stars and more and more revelation is coming. And it was before how you take the word of God for me, you know, it was just the 12 constellations. Okay. What's in that constellation. Um, and after doing this for a year and then, you know, I got a star map, which is not just the main 12 constellations, but the main cons, there's a lot of constellations. There's more than 12. Um, <clears throat> and how they're all placed in the sky and how they're all interacting. Not only are they, the revelatory of the kingdom of God, they interact with each other. So it used to be that I would take the main constellation, pick out the stars and say, hey, wow, this really supports the word of God. Now it's really expanding for me where I am seeing it, the word of God, not, it's not just, it's teaching me the word of God. So now I'm taking what I'm learning from the stars and going back to the word of God. And seeing that it's there also. 
So it's, it's a two part thing. So this month, so we went over and, and, and I kind of remember we've gone over for a year. Or so at least, so we've gone through all of them. So that we're now doubling back and this year I'm learning more. So, but I'm just going to go back, kind of review. Remember we did Capricorn, Aquarius and Pisces, and those were in the sea. And that was sort of the crucifixion, the P Pentecost, and then a harvest, if you recall. So Aquarius was pouring the water over the fish, and that was in indicative of the um, of Pentecost. And then Pisces is the fish, that's the, the fish are the harvest. And then last month we did Aries, and Aries was the first month that I was able to expand and know more. And I learned about these decans, which are each constellation has three constellations that are that go with it, um, called decans. And I don't want to call them minor constellations because this month's de decan is Orion, and it's a huge, it's a huge constellation, probably one of the biggest, most prominent in the sky, and the brightest. But um, what I've learned this month too is how these constellations interact with like constellations from last month, which I'm just learning this. So it's, I'm pretty much a novice, but I'm fascinated by it. So to start off, so Taurus is a bull. He's not just any bull. He is a warring bull. He is depicted as very aggressive, his head is down, he's warring, he's, he, and he's huge. He's, he's not a little cow, he's a big bull. Um, and in Hebrew, his name is Shur, S-H-U-R, or I've seen it S-H-O-R, in Hebrew, the vowels are, um, they don't have vowels, so we make up our, which vowels we want to make it sound like how they're saying it. Sure, I'm saying sure, means coming and ruling. So now we've gone through this crucifixion. We've seen Jesus as the sacrifice, and we've seen him after in the as Aries last month. And so he's no longer the sacrifice, but he's he's the Lamb of God. But now we see him as Taurus, short. He's coming and ruling. And his eye on his eye this is the bull's eye not it, that star's name is el deboran and it means leader or governor um on his left horn is a star named el na which means wounded or slain i'm sorry if my dogs are just are my dogs too loud because they're okay good so wounded or slain so he carries the marks of the crucifixion with him Remember in Genesis, it says about him, and we're going to get into that with Orion, how um, he will bruise, the enemy will bruise his heel, but he will bruise his head. So he he has the mark of the crucifixion. Um, what, what I just found out today, and I looked up and I didn't realize last year, I did talk about Pilates. Pilates means congregation of the judge. Um, and Syriac means... Sukkot, which is Feast of Tabernacles. I just thought that was fascinating. But even more so, I just, right before we got on the call, I looked up, I Googled how many stars are in Pallades. It's 3,000. Wow. So Pallades is a complete picture of the harvest. Pentecost and Pentecost, they baptized 3,000. That was that's it was the first harvest and um i just think that's symbolic of the future harvest and that it's the congregation and then there's a um also another star nearby pallades and they kind of call them like sister stars because is um the name of the star means daughters of the king so here we just have this congregation of the bride of Christ. Um, so in the decans, let's try to put this together. There are so many stars in this constellation that have 
powerful meaning that I didn't want to bore you with all their names. So I'm just doing the main ones. But let, I want to talk about Orion for a minute. Now, Orion is the Deccan, the first Deccan in this star, in this um, constellation. And um, his his biggest star is called Hey Gay At. And this means this is he who triumphs. But Orion itself, the name Orion is, they've changed the spelling. It used to be O. A-R-I-O-N, which means light. And it has some, some of the it has some of the brightest stars in the sky. Um, it's one of the brightest constellations. Um, and there's another star in it called Arana, which means the light of heaven. And in his in Orion's hand, he has a sword. And the sword actually on, on the sword. Uh, where he where it's decorative you know because you have the blade and then you have the top part which is wood it's a picture of a lamb so um and then what's important to note about orion he has his foot he on the head of the enemy and his other foot foot is pricked with the thorn with it with the horn wow. so it shows that picture from genesis um, another, the other Deccan in this constellation is called a rat. I don't know if I'm saying it right. Eridanus. And this is actually a river. This river flows from the foot of Orion. And so there's some talk in ancient writings. Um, we show that this, this river might not be a river of water. It could be but it could be a river of fire, which is the judgment. And so um, we have in Isaiah chapter 30, behold, the name of the Lord comes from far, burning with his anger and the thick rising smoke. So this is a picture of judgment. His lips are full of indignation and his tongue is a devouring fire and his breath is an overflowing stream. So we're talking about and then it says in parentheses on overflowing stream of fire. So this river, which goes down, um, it's called the river of the judge, by the way. And it goes down um, to God's people or like where the Pisces is and all of that. It goes down to the sea part of the sky. Um, but in the middle of this river, is if you remember last month we talked about Cletus, who is the the sea monster. It's like he's trying to stop the river, or he's just like right. So he, um, it, anyway. So he's he's not a Deccan or a part of this constellation, but he's interacting with the constellation. So it tells more of the story. And then the last Deccan in this is called Auriga, and that is a picture of the shepherd. And this, so you've got this calm shepherd here. So also another picture of Jesus. On his one arm, he has, um, well, it's it's a goat. It's a baby goat, but, um, you know, I don't know. You could think of it as a lamb. And then um, he's holding it on his lap. But on this arm, he has two kids goats two baby goats and so this is a picture of him taking care of his people and um the harvest again so while this is going on what i'm seeing in this and i don't know if you guys see anything you've got this river of fire coming down and you've got so this is for judgment right and you have jesus protecting his kids on his lap protecting his children while the river so it's like you're under the shadow of the most high god so um anyways i just love this picture that it's presenting um oh yeah i covered that okay yeah that's it that's i'm gonna write some of these up because like i said there were so many significant stars that 
for me to just list them off. It would have been like a checklist. And this means this, and this means this. And I didn't want to do that, but I think it's fun for, for you to see all of them and their names and what they mean. Yes, very cool. I think you should definitely write that up and post it. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think, um, you know, what you were talking about at the beginning of how you go through these cycles and you look at the stuff and every year you learn more and more. And, you know, that's that's exactly what we've been talking about today as well. You know, there is an increase of Holy Spirit that um, God is pouring out. And for those that are hungry, you know, if you ask for something from the Lord, if you ask for one of the gifts that he's given you to increase, you're going to get an increase, you know, Amen. and and you found um, a lot of joy in these constellations and in searching things out in the sky. And as you keep asking the Lord to show you more, he's giving you greater and greater revelation. Yes. The truth is that he's written all these things in the sky for every one of us to mm -hmm. have the opportunity to look up there and read the story that he's written. You know, it's not boring. It's mm -hmm. very yeah. exciting. <laughs> it's kind of like the word, though, I think um, when you're a novice at it, you sort of just kind of read it slow and then you absorb more and then you absorb more. And that's what's I, I always think about that scripture in Isaiah here a little there a little line upon line precept upon precept. It's just this building block of learning. And so with the um same with the stars. I know the first the first year that I did them, I just had such a elementary level. And I sure I still do. I'm sure my, you know, but it's just so much more. But my level, elementary level of understanding, like really, I just like a Taurus. Oh, he's a bull. Okay, this represents this and then finding more and more about it it's like I didn't realize I didn't have the picture of the sky and how these the sky map and how these stars they're all touching each other the constellations are not separate they tell a complete story it's like a storybook and so that has been so fun and and it's it's going to take like it, they say it takes an eternity to um we'll we'll be learning for eternity and i'm sure the stars are look at how many stars there are yeah. <laughs> you know? so yeah, yeah. And, and and it's that way with every one of the gifts that god gives us you mm -hmm. know it, this is that is the prophetic anointing that we're talking about with issachar it's you know yeah. if when you first start learning that Oh, I heard God. Like it's, oh my gosh, I heard God. Well, you know, the truth is that you can get to the point where you hear him all day long. You're having an ongoing conversation with him. You're seeing things in what's around you. You're noticing the prophetic signs that he brings you. And I just am, am saying this because I'm wanting to stir up that hunger for the gifts of God in everyone's heart like mm -hmm. it's so good and the I, I didn't get a chance to to talk about the dreams because that's a whole nother subject in itself but that's something that the Lord's really been speaking to me about is like you know dream interpretation is like the subject of stars it's oh well we all dream we all know about dreams but how many of us really press in for understanding because the dreams the Lord might be giving you might be super significant to something that he's wanting to do in the world. And if you don't ever ask him about that or you think, well, that's beyond my pay grade, <laughs> you know, well, it's a sad thing because we're all missing out because you haven't stepped into the fullness of your ability to get a dream from God and convey it to the rest of the body of Christ that's waiting to hear from you. So each one of us has such an important role. And I, I just, you know, like we need to encourage one another daily. We need to support each other we need to try to help each other in our giftings and callings because 
no matter how much of a novice you might be today, in three years from now, you could be a giant. Mm -hmm. you know? And don't be afraid to step into those things and, and learn because mm -hmm. it's totally worth it. Yes, it is. It's so good. Amen. Okay, are we anything else before we move on to the first fruits offering? Are you going to do Psalm 119? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So as we've discussed before, Psalm 119 is broken up into eight verse stanzas. At every stanza, within every stanza, every verse within that stanza starts with the same Hebrew letter. And so our Hebrew letter for the month of ER is Vav, which is a picture of connection or linking. So um, there are eight verses. I'm not going to read through all of them for this month. I just This month, it's verse 41 through 48 um, in Psalm 119. So it's Psalm 119, 41 through 48 are the verses for this month. I just want to hit on the last one. 48, because we were talking earlier about Moses lifting up his hands in that yada position and the victory coming. Verse 48 says, I will lift up my hands toward your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. So, Amen. just again, see that picture of uplifted hands and loving his commandments and meditating on his statutes and um yeah so i just want to encourage us to read through maybe a little it just takes a few minutes even just every day this month to just read through those eight verses and about it talks about his steadfast love coming to us his salvation the word of truth keeping his laws continually walking in that place with him sought his seeking his precepts so and speaking of it are our testimonies so I'm just extending that as a little personal challenge for all of us to meditate on those verses throughout the month. Yes, great. Amen. Okay, well, I will go ahead and do the first fruits offering if you are ready. So as our custom is, we have been writing down our first fruits offering on a piece of paper and, um, or it doesn't have to be written on a piece of paper. You could have your actual offering, but if you have it ready, you can just wave it before the Lord. And um, Lord, we just thank you for all that you do and all the provision that you've given us. And as we want to give our first and our best to you, Lord, I just pray that you will just impress upon each of our hearts what it is that you want us to give. And Lord, we just thank you for everything you've done and everything you're doing. And that um, if we could just give a small back to you, a small bit of that back to you and sow it into the seed of our future in the name of Yeshua. Yes. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to thank everyone again for being with us this evening for this uh, Signs and Seasons first fruits call for the month of the R. This will be posted here in the group um, after we finish tonight. Once it finishes processing, you people you can watch it later um, here in the Signs and Seasons group page on Facebook. Um, be watching for additional posts throughout the month as we've been kind of talking about throwing some, some new material out throughout the month and as the Lord leads. So we'll be watching for that. And uh, I guess other than that, we will see you unless something else comes up between now and then. We'll see you again in about a month for our, uh, the next First Fruits call. We'll be watching for that. Your hosts this evening have been Laura Judah, Deborah Taylor, and myself, Rachel Wilkins. And I thank you again for being here. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. The Lord turn his countenance toward you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua, and we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And for God's blessings on Israel, his people, and his sons and daughters throughout the world. Good night. Amen. Amen.